All right, so welcome to the second lecture. I'll let you just go ahead and pile in if you can. No worries, there's plenty of open spaces somewhere, I think. Right, some over here, some over here, some over here, right? Um, okay, so um, if you haven't been, if this is your first time in the class because you know you just got in or something, I will be uploading the uh, video of the last lecture uh, tonight, as well as th as today's video. So I'll be able to put a new playlist together. I'll also have for reference all of last semester's stuff. Um, although last semester's was in a different or order. I just wanted to take a second and just show you your textbook, right? Um, right, I don't know if we're gonna hit all 20 chapters, that'd be pretty ambitious. Uh, first chap yesterday was essentially the first chapter, which was going over the, these things. I'll assign probably over the weekend some, thing, some exercises to check off from, uh, from the first and second chapter. Uh, very simple things. Um, but otherwise, uh, and I'll let you know if I do so. Okay, you'll get like one of those announcements via email. And it's one of those things, just please do it by the end of the semester rather than do it by tomorrow. But, right, um, once, once I got a better handle of the system, I, I will be giving more definite due dates on that kind of stuff. But right now, just focus on worrying about your labs and the like. Um, so with the, let's see, so debugging modules, turtles. So we've got actually quite a bit of time before we get to, yeah, where's the if statement coming in here? Do we, do we have that yet? Control F if. Oh, that was super helpful. Uh, whole word. That was also super helpful. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so just kind of want to give an idea of, um, right, we don't really expect you to uh, be able to program basically for the beginning, but uh, program programming is pretty awesome. Uh, so, like, here's a pri Python program. This is what we kind of want to get to at the end of the uh, textbook. Examples are like this program over here, 30 li 33 lines long, and what it will do um, is that this converts image uh, color images to black and white. Um, and what's cool about this textbook is that I can just hit this, hit this button and here's the image and you can see that it is slowly converting it into black and white. So the great thing about this textbook is that it just will run in the browser. Um, and yeah, this looks like gibberish right now. That's okay. It actually looks, it looks like partial gibberish to me because, I'm, because I totally don't know everything from the, uh, from, uh, the way it works. But I do understand like, I have no idea why we're dividing by two and dividing by three over here, okay? But I do know it probably has something to do with uh, the way color works and stuff I've learned about that. Um, and there, it's gonna go, f uh, um, also an interesting thing to know about programming is that this process of converting this into a black and white uh, photo, this isn't the only way to do things. There's lots of ways to do things in, pro in, in a programming language. Uh, but, you know, there's, it's um, it's a you know it's a complicated thing. Uh, let's see. Um, there's let's see, save and run. Will that do anything? Cool. Um, but anyway, that's kind of where we can get to the with the end of this textbook. This textbook's pretty good. Even if we don't get to the end, there's going to be lots of valuable things over there. We're going to learn uh, how to do some basic stuff with graphics. Ooh, cool. That was uh, scary. Um, Yawning squirrel looks now a bit more insidious. Um, but there's kind of image manipulation that, can, that we can do here. Um, now last time what we went over were basically the um, idea here that we have, um, that we have these, uh, that basically we have this programming language. And the idea here is what Python is as a programming language, is that it's a language that humans can understand, but uh, we don't, but, um, but the computer might not natively be able to. Really, your computer is just like this rock with a bunch of electricity that we tricked it to be able to, into thinking for us. So, you know. Um, and really, all it knows is ones and zeros, 
uh, that all commands eventually get translated down to those th a bunch of sequences of electrical signals that we just simply write down as ones and zeros to represent an, a, a strong electric current or weak electric current. Is there a current there or no, it, uh, or not? And that gets down really into the hardware level, but which we don't really need to worry about um, because that's computers have gotten to the point where basically you could know everything there is to know about the part of the computer where basically there are people who specialize in certain parts of chips, you know, you know, or certain, so, so knowing everything about computer science is impossible at this point. Um, so we don't program in English, which is what they say here is a natural language, uh, because um, natural languages are ambiguous, right? And one of the things we talked about algorithms is that they have to be unambiguous. And so formal languages, these things like uh, programming languages, are unambiguous because of the rules they have. Um, and so as a result, we've got to take this language we developed, Python, and turn it into ones and zeros. So the way we do that is we use a, special, a specialized program called the interpreter. right? And the interpreter is just something that will translate this sentence, hello world, into a into something that actually you know the computer can understand. So the interpreter's job is to take a, a look at a line of Python code and turn it into actual ones and zeros. Now we went over last time the idea of how we can use um, the print function, and that's really all we've done so far. So to review, not that there's again much to review. Um, I had a program called hello, and what it did is that it printed out the word hello, then under the line it said, how are you, and then Professor Rosen says hello, and what we learned at the very end was, is that there's these special symbols um, that we have uh, called escape sequences. So there were four of them, and right now I'm gonna, give, I'm gonna write them down over here so they're easier to see in what we call a comment. Notice that I, with the, with the um, hash symbol or the number symbol I put over here, uh, that is red. Anything, so what is a comment? Uh, I'll go ahead and run this program. Notice I just put a bunch of gibberish behind that hash mark. And I run it and it had no problem with the fact that I just inserted a bunch of gibberish. What a comment is is that basically sometimes programs are hard. In fact, lots of programs are hard to write. Um, and sometimes you do something insanely esoteric and like add this random number that you discover that helps approximate Newton's function. True story, not mine. Uh, last, uh, last inverse square root, um, if you wanna look that up. But anyway, you find, these, you find some stuff that helps out and basically you wanna remind yourself next week why in the world you did this thing. Because trust me, next week if you don't put down a reminder, you're gonna forget. This is where comments come in. Comments are basically a special are any are basically these they depend on language on the, the language but their role is the same. Uh, in Java, if you want to leave a comment, it's two forward slashes, and but in Python, we just simply use the hash symbol or the pound symbol or the numerical symbol, right? Whatever you want to call it. But here we just use this com to comment stuff. And what happens is that the computer will ignore that and everything else in the line after it. So here I can say, this prints hello. Right? There's a bunch of seats like over there and there. Um, so we just run that. And so notice that it doesn't, do, it doesn't crash to anything. So this is a good way to do stuff like maybe put your name on the program. like. Okay, right? And now I, I've said that this one is, that this program is mine or something like that. Uh, you can, but most, most of the time it's used to do these kind of documentary you notes know, like this one, this prints hello to remind you what it's doing. So now that you know what that is, I can say, I can now put, uh, put some more information about those lines. Um, such as slash n is a new line Right? Slash slash prints 
is a slash. Let's go ahead. Slash. Uh, quote slash t is a tab, and then slash quotation mark is a quote. Uh, they're the only ones uh, that you really have to care about. I also won't be directly testing you on these because you're going to use them so much you're going to, the assumption is you're going to know what they are. So um, now this isn't all that Python can do which is print out stuff. Um, in fact if all we could do is print out stuff or just evaluate things like this uh, 4 plus 5. So here I'm again working in the repo. The, uh, the basically just the terminal where it's just going to read, evaluate, print, and then keep doing that. Boop. So here, if that's pretty boring, then you're, you've got, we've basically got less power than a calculator. Okay, but let's go ahead and explore the mathematical operations that we can do in Python before we move on to variables. Okay, so Python, uh, so part of the, uh, of the motivation for create, again, uh, from yesterday you saw that basically the big motivation for creating computers is that numbers are hard, doing numbers and adding them together is hard, let's make systems that do that instead for us because that way I don't have to spend my t the, you know, most of my day doing these things and I can do something else like, you know, I don't know, work on an interesting problem or maybe read books. So, um, so there are your basic, so we have a lot of your basic operations in Python the, and they work Unfortunately, unlike other languages, they work exactly the way you'd expect them to do, uh, that they would want to work. Um, so as you plainly see, we have addition. 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus 7, right? We'll add all those numbers together, and that will give me an answer, right? Plus is perfectly fine. I can also just go ahead and like put a print statement around that, like print 4, I can do, I can do that expression in there, 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus 7. I should note that basically anything I write, mathematical or otherwise, is an expression. And Java's is, and Python's job is to evaluate expressions. And the reason why I often accidentally say Java a lot of the time is because I also teach a Java class, so you know. Um, so context switching is hard. Um, so here, again, we can do um, addition operations. We can also do uh, subtraction operations. Four minus five uh, minus two. So this will be 4 minus 5 minus 2, which will give us negative 3, right? 4 minus 5, negative 1. Negative 1 minus negative 2, sorry, minus 2 is 3, right? So works exactly like you, you would say. Uh, what about 4 minus 5 plus 2? 1, as you would expect, right? Negative 1 plus 2 gives you 1. So you can mix those things together. Um, you can also do a unary operator, although you never really think about these. We call these things binary operators because they, ta they take two things and operate on them, right? They take two operands. So your operator works on two operands, hence binary, by two, versus a unary operator, which takes a number and takes one operator and operates on it, right? Negative four. Okay, um, zero plus minus four, what is that going to translate to? That's actually a very badly formatted zero, zero plus negative four. Okay, generally though you don't have to worry too much about that stuff, right? Always try to make your stuff readable as opposed to being deliberately hard to read like this. Okay. Uh, so we've got addition and subtraction. And the good thing to know is that if you've passed like the fifth grade, then you probably um, know the most important thing about this, which is PEMDAS, uh, you know, or order of operations. It's the exact same in, in any programming language. Uh, so five plus one times three, right? We can evaluate that in one of two ways. We can either think that's going to be 18, so 6 times 3, or 5 plus 3, right? But it's order of operations, which means parentheses, exponents, and then multiplication, division, and then addition, subtraction, right? 
So here, if we're doing PEMDAS rules, then it's going to be, we're going to do one times three first, and then add it to five. Oh, sorry, I just, so the reason it gave me instant tax error there is that I had that highlighted, then I pressed enter, which deleted everything there, and then it proceeded to evaluate that. So, um, so that's why I got an invalid syntax there. So let's go ahead, that was one times three, and that will give me eight, right? Order of operations. So we care about order of operations in, in uh, Python um, a whole lot. Um, we also care, so again, so let's go ahead and now see if we do use parentheses, four plus one times three, that's gonna give us 18, right? Parentheses first, then exponents. Wait a second, how in the world do I do exponents in this bloody thing, right? Exponents are like tiny little numbers that hang out, hang out above, above this. Uh, excellent question, glad you asked. Um, so let's go ahead and do five squared. So um, some languages do this, uh, which that is not five squared, is it? What in the world, <laughs> right? What in the world is that? What? So five, so this operation is actually, I think, an exclusive or operation. Yeah, it's supposed to be just a plus, basically. And that's, yeah, it, it, it's, it's weird. So we'll get into exclusive or and other things like that later. But yeah, so, uh-oh. Um, that, that, that did not do what we thought it was going to do. And by the way, you wouldn't expect that this would do something. Uh, or this. Wait, we have... Don't worry, you don't have to worry about those operations. They just, just they exist. Uh, those, are, um, those are literal binary operations where we do binary zor, binary and, and binary or. What in the world, <laughs> right? Okay, no, we can ignore that for right now. Just know that, they, just put it in your back of your mind that maybe we computer scientists have some extra responsibility when it comes to programming. But you will rarely use these unless you're trying to simulate something that has to deal with individual bits like little bits of information. What is a bit? Bit is short for binary digit. In other words, a zero or a one. We'll get into binary later. Don't worry about it. But that's what we say when we mean a bit, a binary digit. Computers group stuff in groups of eight bits or a byte. Don't know why we call it a byte, um, but that's why. Um, but again, Let's, so let's go ahead and focus on operations. So how in the world do we do exponentiation? In Py it varies on the language. Python actually has something I find intuitive, which is that if we want to square something, I use star star. I use two multiplication symbols in a row. And it will give me 25. It's actually not the most unintuitive thing, right? Let's go ahead and see if that does follow order of operations, though. Uh, one, so two times two. Let's go with two times three. Uh, squared. Okay, so two times, so if it was two times three and then we squared that, it would be 36, right? Two times three is six. Then raised to the power of two would be six, it would be 36. Um, by the way, I have the advantage of coming up with these in my head before I put them down, so that's why I'm able to give you the answer as opposed to, so, so don't feel bad if you're having trouble. So three squared is nine times two would give us 18. So which one is it gonna give us? It's gonna give us 18. So it does follow order of operations where we do parentheses, exponents, multiplication, division, then addition, subtraction. Make, so, so PEMDAS still holds. The things you learned in, uh, in middle school or elementary school, or whenever, you, or in, and, but you probably learned, relearned it multiple times. So uh, the thing that you kept getting taught about, taught about order of operation, it still holds. All right, so multiplication, addition, subtraction, no unexpected scary things have happened. Nothing has happened that's scary about those. Exponentiation, okay, the only thing that's changed is that, uh, that the symbol I thought I was gonna use for exponentiation does something weird instead. So instead I have to do times times to do exponentiation. But that's okay because exponentiation is like a shortcut for doing multiple multiplications anyway, so that kind of makes sense, right? Five squared is just doing five times five. Five cubed is just five times five times five, right? So makes kind of sense that basically that I would use star star. All right, 
So, uh, so, so now, uh, fortunately, if there was in if this so if this was Java, I'd be saying that basically we'd be running into our first headache here because division wouldn't work the way you'd expect it to in Java. In Python three, however, because uh, because of the way that uh, there was this just top level decision, we want Py division to be intuitive, right? And the way it's going to work. So. Um, Let's go ahead and see 18 divided by 3. That's going to give me 6.0. Not 6, but 6.0. That's interesting. Okay. So that gets into something about, about that. Um, let's go ahead and try um, 5 divided by 2. That gives me 2.5. Completely expected there. Now, fortunately for me, I can actually show you guys what would happen in Java. Because Java has a REPL now, it didn't used to have that. So um, this is just simply Java, and it's going to do the same. I'm just simply going to give the same expression. You don't know how, have to know how Java works, but jo the way Java does is the way the vast majority of pro uh, computer programs do that. Five divided by two gives you two. Wait, what? Uh, Eighteen divided by um, three gives you six, not six point zero, but nineteen divided by three also gives you six. And that's the case until you get to 21. Um, so essentially, most programming languages, uh, they, it cares whether, what, uh, what you're doing, about whether you're dealing with what we call integers or floating point numbers. In other words, integers are real numbers. Um, so the most programming languages, when you do a division sign, it will just simply throw out the, remain, the, the last, everything after, you know, everything after the decimal point, right? But that's not the expected behavior, right? If you're dividing five by two, you'd expect two and a half. And Python made this decision to go against the grain and say, yeah, we're going to go the way we expect it to run, work. So five divided by two is two and a half. But why is it going 6.0, right? So there's a difference, again, between these two numbers. Uh, there's your floating, you've got basically two types of numbers. We've got our floating point numbers, and we've got our integers. Integers are exactly what they sound like. They're just these big numbers that are whole, right, that don't have any floating points in them. Uh, now, in other programming languages, I'd be saying there's a limit, like to 2 billion or something like that, as to how big they can get. Uh, Python doesn't care. Give me one second. Right, um, raise it to the, I guess, 10th power, sure. Yeah, Python doesn't really care. And those also just, just take a second to appreciate just how quickly that went. Like it was instantaneous from me hitting enter to me getting that number. Um, let's go ahead and, exp and raise that to the 10th power, this giant thing to the 10th power and see how that well that goes. Pretty well. Pretty well, right? Python does not care. It does not care about such paltry limitations as the size of numbers that other programming languages have to deal with. Integers can be as big as it damn well pleases. So, you know. Um, this is, um, so again, at some point though, my computer will grind to a screeching halt pleading uh, because, oh, and oh, it, it finished. It just simply says it squeezed it because, it, because the answer is 3,109 lines long of number. So the, so the, so just, this is a lot more powerful than your four function calculator, suffice to say, okay? Now, um, all right, so a couple things we should probably check. Um, what happens if I divide by zero? Does my computer crash, right? That happens, if we, I mean, that happens in science fiction. We make the robots divide by zero and the humans save, them, save, uh, save themselves. Uh, it just gives me an error. It says that you can't divide by zero. Okay, what if I divide zero by zero? This also says that I can't divide by zero. Great, okay. Uh, what if I do a zero, 5 point zero divided by zero? Still gives me uh, zero. It says float division by zero. So you can't divide by zero, we'll just crash, and it'll tell you that you can't divide by zero, which is excellent. So it's not gonna randomly crash, it's just gonna tell you you can't divide by zero. Good to know, okay. Um, now, integers, so the integers, just big whole numbers. Uh, floating points, those are numbers that anything that has a decimal point, 
is a floating point number. So 2.5 is a floating point number. And if we multiply it by 3, we get 7 and a half. If I multiply it by 2, I get 5.0, not 5. So this is an interesting thing to notice. Floating point numbers, they do not necessarily, uh, they, they basically are a completely different class of numbers, right? So they don't necessarily uh, trans, translate back into integers, right? We don't translate, you never take an, uh, a floating point number and translate it back into an integer. So we never end up, so 2.5 times 2, that doesn't become 5, that just simply stays 5.0. Now, why is that? Well, really, Java's like, okay, I've got, sorry, Python's like, I've got a floating point on this side, and I've got a 2 on this side. The floating point is the more expressive type, so I'm going to convert the integer, this 2, into 2.0. So this becomes 2.5 times 2.0. And so your answer is going to be a floating point number. So basically, integer, at, uh, uh, an integer and an integer, they mix together, they're going to produce an integer. A floating point and a floating point is going to produce a floating point. A floating point and an integer are going to produce a floating point, right? We convert up to the more, to the more, to what we consider the stronger type. Um, this is because in other programming languages, it's the floating points that produ pr uh, produce much less of a limitation. Um, so let's go ahead and say 5.0 raised to the 5,000th power overflow. So that matters for that. Interesting. It, it looks like things, though, are reversed in Python compared to other languages. This is because floating point numbers are have this standard, the an IEEE standard. It's like 931 or something like that, 951. The point is, is that basically that there's a certain specification of the way the number gets stored on your computer in binary. Because remember, these are base 10 numbers I'm seeing on my screen, but the computer is doing everything in base 2. In other words, in ones and zeros, right? We're doing in every, everything in zeros through nines. The computer does everything from in zeros and ones. Um, which, by the way, leads to some interesting results. Um, one, so anyway, let's go ahead and so let's go ahead and just see some interesting interactions with with what we do with division. So, like, if I were to do one divided by six, it gives me one point six six. You know, so we get this infinite repeating thing that eventually just term, terminates, right? Really, this is one sixth, right? But we can't, but this sixth just keeps going on forever. We, we, and this is because the base 10 number system really can't express this infinitely repeating digit that well. So there's some things that just number systems can't express well, and like this, this is that. Also notice that one divided by six, that was an integer divided by an integer, that produced a floating point. So when you never use the, this division sign, the single division sign like this, that is floating point division. It says I want to use, I want to convert the two my operands into floating points, and we're going to the answer is going to be in floating points because that's what most users expect to happen. Um, the other thing before we move on, and, and that, and so we've got this again. It's things are not able to be expressed properly in. Like, things like this aren't properly able to be expressed in floating point, uh, sorry, in base 10, okay? Similarly, some things don't get properly expressed in base 2. This is like one of the only times you're going to see this. It's very rare, but it does happen. So 1.0 plus 2.0, this is something that's easily expressed in base 10, right? Gives you 0.3, right? But your computer actually has trouble expressing this number. And watch what happens. Gives me 0.3 and a bit. Close enough for government work, so this big. But I mean, it's like, I mean, but it is not 3.0. And again, it's because there's, a, there's, with floating points, there's a memory limitation. You, give, you have 64 bits of being able to store this information. And we're given this kind of repeating sum over there. And then it just has to terminate it. And so this is about as small as a uh, num number it can store. Uh, 
but for the most part, when you're doing in, when you're doing science, right? Maybe your significant figures need you only need like six at the most, right? This is well more than six figures. So most of your computations, you can cut off that last bit, and you don't have to care about it. The point of a lot of times when we do operations with computers, the um, a lot a lot of the answers we get, the any error that you get from using floating point numbers is going to be well below. Uh, the what you need from an experiment. Um, just be aware of that that doesn't that doesn't really happen like for a lot of things like 1.0 plus 2.0, right? It's no problem expressing that kind of stuff. It's just these very very weird edge cases. Yes. Um, there is a way, um, I, and I don't know off the top of my head because I have to because I have to switch between like three languages. Um, but there, I think there is a way to get. A specific number of significant figures. Um, the, or rather, I don't know the best way because you can always convert it into a string and slice it off, and and then convert it back. But I always, but I forget. Um, okay. Anyway, I was mentioning that this is that this is float division, standard division, which implies that there's actually integer division because actually it's very very useful to have that in. Uh, in um, a language. So for instance, one, two, three, four, divide, divide by 10, divide, divide, gives me 123. Now this produces integer division. In other words, this is fourth grade division, which is that basically, remember when you were in fourth grade and doing, or fifth grade, or whenever you got taught div, uh, long division, right? When you did long division, and I'm just going to briefly put it up on the board, right? Um, you did something like this, right? Here's a thousand. I create my workspace to, or rather here, my answer was, sorry, not a thousand, but it was one, two, three, four, right? And we were dividing by 10. And I'm not going to bother going through all the work, right, for long division. But your, your answer in fourth grade or fifth grade or whenever you were taught it, it would be 123 <coughs> remainder four, right? Everybody remember that? Way back when? Okay. So what did I get when I did divide divide? I got this number, 123. That gives me, so this gives me the quotient in fourth grade division. In other words, this gives me integer division. What I, so in other words, throw out everything, basically throw out the, uh, right, this is 123.4, but all I do is just throw out the four. Right? All I did is throw out the point four, rather. Make sense to everybody? Sorry about that. Okay. So let's just review. We have what what operations what operators do I have here? I have plus, I have minus, I have multiplication and exponentiation. I also have division, float division and fourth grade division, or integer division, right? In other words, do I want a decimal point or do I not want the decimal point? Make sense to everybody? Do I care about the decimal point? Do I not care about the decimal point? That's what I care about, I hear. So, um, however, if there's an operator to get the quotient over here, it makes sense that there's also an operator to get this number over here, which is a lot more bloody useful than you'd think. Okay, and so let me introduce you to the last operator, modulo, or as we'll just call it, mod. One, two, three, four, mod, whoops, sorry, mod 10. So last one is the parentheses, is the parent, not parentheses, but uh, percentage sign, which we use as the modulo operator. A lot of times in, um, in, in mathematics, you'll often see it written out as this, M-O-D, mod, but um, you can think, now it has all these nice mathematical terms, like, like you can create a modulo space where it just wraps around. Those, that's not important right now. What's important is knowing that, that this gives you the remainder when you divide, one, this give, will give you the remainder. One, two, three, four, mod 10 gives you the remainder after you divide by 10. Um, interesting, 
So I, I said this is an extremely useful thing. Now why is that? Uh, well, when we just, so just off, just with this example, modding anything by 10 will give you the last digit, which is pretty useful, right? Um, if I were to mod by 100, it would give me the last two digits. And it does so very efficiently. So it's a very quick way to do that kind of thing. It's useful to know, right? Um, right? For instance, one of the exercises we'll eventually work on is basically trying to is basically trying to figure out which number, which of these numbers fits, uh, you know, it fits a you know fits a street address we're trying to find, and we know it the street address either ends with a three or a seven, right? So, a good way to do that is to test the number. If you want to check if that number ends with a three or seven, we would mod by ten and ask, is that number a three or is that number a seven? So, it's a so this is pretty useful. Uh, the other common use you're going to see, uh, see for it is checking if a number is even or odd. Uh, if we divide by something by 2, there's only two options by, for the remainder, right? It's going to be a remainder 0 if it's an even number, a remainder 1 if it's a, so right, 1, 2, 3, 4 is an even number, so the remainder is 0. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 1, 2, 3, 3 mod to remainder 1. So the modulo operator will get more practice on, a lot more practice on. Um, on in, so you're probably asking, oh god, do I need a calculator for my exam? And the answer is, god no, god no. Um, so let me give you, so most of my, uh, if there are big questions, if, if you have to do big num numerical operations on my exam, it's a trick question. Uh, one of my favorites, of course, is something like this. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, divided by, um, Let's see, divide, divide, some other big number. Anybody want to hazard a guess as to what this is? Yes. Uh, what? No, it's not the top number, but good guess. What is this? Yes. Zero? It's zero, right? Some number divided by an even bigger number. There's The quotient is zero, remainder one, two, three, four, five, six, right? But what you were thinking of over there is that if, if it's this, some other random number, What's the answer? It's the top number, right? Because the remainder is, the, because this number goes in, divide by, so this number divided by this number, right? Is it going to be 0? Or is it going to be, right? So if I divide this number by this number, it can't, this number can't go into this number any number of times. It's just too darn big. So the entire number is the remainder, right? Um, or as I like to do is again another big number like that mod 10 which just simply asks for the last digit right what's the remainder after the last digit so um, those are the kinds of questions that you'll get on probably like the first exam when it, when it goes to the module operator most of the time those are like super exaggerated examples because I'm just hammering on a keyboard right now um, but it's nothing too scary believe it or not right um, the point is, is that if you need to use, if you feel like you need to ca use a calculator on, on my exam, then you are overthinking it. Um, so, these are your operators that you can use in um, in Java, as in Python, and in Java. Um, just worthwhile to note, right? Um, so, let's just go ahead. Twelve mod ten. That gives me what? Two, right? Last digit of that number. So if I were to do five, so let me do two plus twelve mod ten. What the heck's the order of operation? Any? So there's two possibilities. It's going to happen before the addition or after the addition, right? So what kind of operation is modulo? Yes, it's a division operation, right? To get, so this, you, to figure it out, you have to divide. So it kind of makes intuitive sense that we would want to put it with, in the same classification as a division operation. Two plus two is four. So again, if this seems scary, and, and uh, then uh, that's because you just haven't had the chance to practice it yet. Really, I've introduced only one new thing, and that's the modulo of this operator. Yes. Fourteen mod ten is also four. Fourteen mod ten. 
Ah! Clever. Thank you for pointing that out. All right, so let's go ahead and make this uh, five. Mmm. Mmm. Oh, boy. What's going on here? It's because, so here's the thing. Most of the time with module operator, it happens actually, at least in mathematics, we care about it being at the end because it happens in a, in a mod, in what we call mod space. You are never going to see this kind of thing. This is bad, or rather you, you never really want to see this kind of thing. So, right, mod 10 plus two, what is the world is this gonna be? It's gonna be four. Okay, what about 12 mod 10 times 20? 40. It doesn't really seem to follow any rules. <laughs> Unless, what's the rule that it is following? It's following the rule of It is actually still, actually this is a, the, the issue is that I've got a terrible example here. <laughs> it is order of operation um, where basically, the order of operations is, um, yeah, it's still this, it's still multiplication first because guess what? This is the same case as the one above it where I switched it to five. Yep, right? Tw if this goes, if five plus 12, that becomes 17 mod 10, that becomes seven. If I do 12 mod 10, that's two plus five, so it ends up being, okay. Now that's a bit tricky. Okay, so let's, it's funny, I seem to have programmed myself into a corner there. Uh, 10, so let's go ahead and do 10 plus, sorry? The last one's fine, right? Yeah, the last one's fine because what we're seeing here is that this happens before the multiplication operation because it goes left to right. So it is on the same tier as multiplication. So in other words, multiplication, division, modulo. All that matters which one goes first is the one that appears left to right. But the modulo operator is always going to happen before addition or subtraction. Okay, so I think I've confused people. All right, let's go ahead and just simply give one more example. So five plus two, uh, let's go ahead and do, actually, 500 plus one, hmm. There we go. It's going to be 499 regardless because of this bloody exam. <laughs> I don't. You know, I'm having a hard time thinking of an example off the top of my head where it's going to have a different op answer off the order of operations. So I'm just going to move on because because I know for a fact that it is order of operations is multi is on the same tier as multiplication. So. Anyway, so the, moving on to the next thing, which is variables. So um, trying to remember like stuff like this and plug, plug in numbers sometimes is annoying. Did you find one? It looks like you set them. I think it's gonna be like this and then comes out. So it's gonna do this times nine. And then ah, okay. Thank you, Kat. Yeah. By the way, this is one of our TAs. Uh, Everybody I have met. So not, not just some random student who decided to, <laughs> to, to do the lecture for Take me instead, over, yeah. right? No. Actually, she has taken over a couple lectures for me <laughs> on, on request and, um, and might do so in the future for this semester. So she pointed out this expression, right, is a good way of saying that it's in the same precedence because, right, what we're doing here is 4 mod 10. Sorry, 10 mod 4 times 9 mod 5. 
Now, the way order of operations work when we do stuff, uh, I'm sorry, when we do multiplication operations or multiplication division operations is that we simply just go like right to left. So it would be 10 mod 4 times 9. So what is 10 mod 4? 2, right? Four div 10 divided by 2 gives us 2 remainder 2, right? Gets us 8 out of the 10, and then that there's 2 left over. Times 9, so what's 2 times 9? 18. And then 18 divided, and then 18 mod 5. 18 mod 5 gives us 3. So it's, same, so it's the same precedence as multiplication, right? Same tier. And so it goes left to right. And if there was an addition operator somewhere, well, then that would be last, which I'll just simply show now. Right? One plus all this stuff because that happened first. Thanks. Um, so now, so that's basically, so we've gone over basically that this is a super powerful calculator, but there's got to be something uh, more to it than that. Let's go ahead and see. We've got our values and our data types. So what we've been working with are things called literals right now. So int literals, uh, string literal, uh, so int literals and um, float literals. There's also, um, we've also been working with string literals, but literals mean that they are literally not in a variable. They literally exist. So this is a literal. It's this weird word for it, but it's just simply saying it's not a variable, right? We've not been working with variables. Also, we've been working with strings, um, right? There is a difference. Python cares, and every other programming language cares. There's a difference between five and the symbol five. And I do mean symbol in the same way that I mean letter. It's weird to say letter, so I have to say symbol. But this is different, right? Also, this was came out with uh, single quote marks. Interesting uh, thing in Python, it doesn't care. Python's one of those languages that does not care whether it's single quotation or double quotation. You can use whichever you prefer. So, but this is basically saying it is the string five. And the symbol five. And that has some consequences. Five plus five, right, the letter five, so the, the symbol five plus this number five says you cannot add these things together. Okay? You cannot add these things together. Yes? So is there a difference between a char and a string? Not in Python. There is no difference between a char and a string other than the fact that a char is just a single character string. Right. So his question is: There a difference between chars and strings in Python? And the answer is not really. Um, so what is a char? A char is a character. In other languages, you build strings from characters, right? And all that is is just a character is just a string of one length. So that's what he means. So a character is an individual symbol in a string. So, but there's in Python it simplifies it by basically at least in the beginning we only have to care about three types. We have to care about, um, we, because we're going to be working primarily with these three types. Integers, a type of number. A floating point, a type of number. And strings, everything that's not numbers. Or if they're numbers, then we don't care about the literal value of the numbers. We just care about the glyph that we drew the number with. right? You can't add um, strings and integers together. You could add strings and floats together, right? two plus so two plus two and a half, that's perfectly fine. But Python doesn't like adding things unless you, um, unless it, when, when they're strings. Uh, so it doesn't like adding strings to not strings. So it's perfectly acceptable to add two strings together. And the result may not be, in, it is both unintuitive and intuitive at the same time. So programming languages try to have something called the principle of least surprise, which is that the answer you get is the least surprising. So remember, this is a symbol added to another symbol, right? So 5 plus 5, you might think it should be the letter 10, one, the letters 1 and 0. But what is your answer if I were to say, what if it was A plus A? Any suggestions as what to what, what a good way to add those two things together are? Yeah, two A's together. 
And that's exactly what we get. When you add strings together, you essentially just glue them together into a new string. So A plus B will give you AB. String 5 plus string 4 gives us 5, 4. Right? Not 54, 5, 4. Right? It's a string of those two, of those two numbers together. Um, so um, now, fortunately, you're probably going, oh, God, do I have to learn how, what happens when I divide strings? Uh, a divided by B. And yes, you do have to know what happens when we divide A by B, which is that we get an error. <laughs> you can't do it. Right? Same with subtraction. It makes no sense to do subtraction. Um, what about A times B? Doesn't make sense either. Okay. However, there is one weird, there is one thing that's exclusive to Python and maybe some other languages, but I found it in Python and it's not in like the other languages, which is A times 5. Now again, this works, principle of least surprise, so it's going to be the least surprising thing. What do you think the answer is going to be? Five A's, right? That makes sense. Five A's. So you can multiply a string to just get a lot of strings at once, right? If you want to, if you, right? So if you want to do something really quick, like all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy, right? Oh, and let's go ahead and give it a, right? So there, I've like done the work of the shining in like one line of text. So, yeah, so there. <laughs> so, you know, it is, so you can multiply, so you can see there's an obvious use for repetition. In fact, most programming languages only really are made up of three types of statements. Uh, and we're working right now with a single type of statement called the imperative statement. Um, imperative, right, imperial, making commands, right? As though you're like some kind of god creating your own, you know, or emperor making your own like subject do stuff. And I mean, that's what your computer is. Although it's best to view your, uh, um, view your computer and your programming language not as some kind of humble servant who's willing to do your every bidding and fulfill your every desire, but think of your computer as an evil genie who will fulfill exactly what you say, exactly as you say it, and well, if that blows something up, well, you should have worded your wish better. Um, a, lot of your, a lot of errors are just simply you shooting yourself in the, in the foot. Um, and that's not me saying you're stupid, except it is. I'm just saying that we're all stupid, myself included in this, and every other person in the building. We are humans with limitations, and um, you know, it's like when, have you ever seen that, like, uh, count the number of Fs in the sentence and it has a bunch of ofs and you instinctively forget to count the F in of, or people do? That's the kind of thing that you're going to get. Or, or if you're proofreading and you forget to see that there's two thes in a sentence, right? Right? So you so see if there's one, at the end of the line. one if there's one at the end of the line or at the beginning of the line and the beginning of the next line, right? So the, and where's the topic of the, the paper is... Right? And you forget the second duck. So, all right, so three types so far. Um, everything in Python does have a type, um, and we can convert from types pretty easily. So, say for some reason I needed to turn, um, okay, I don't know why that's, okay, can I create a new shell? Or shell, um, we start shell. There we go, nice, okay. So if, I, so if I wanted to um, say turn five back into a number, there's a way to do that, right? The symbol five into number. I can use something called the int function, okay? Which turns it into five. Uh, fo and function are these commands. Um, in idle, they come up in a nice like purplish color, right? So they're things like print. Right, which give it a command, and you know their functions because they have these parentheses that you use them. They're like mathematical functions have parentheses, like f of x, right? Although f of x really isn't defined here, right? It says f is not defined, right? Um, int over here, if we point it out, it says it's a class int. It's really just a function, really is what it's saying. So 
um, you need the parentheses in order to execute a function. So here, what we're saying, and oh, yeah, when I'm typing, it's saying, hey, here's what we are going to do. Put in some number, and it'll convert it. Also, there's an option of using the base over here. By default, the base is 10. So I'm just simply going to, so I can take 4, throw it into the int function, and it turns into 4. I can also take the floating point, 4.5, and let's see what happens. It cuts out that 0.5 and turns it into an integer. So int, so for every type, for those three types, int, string, uh, float, and string, there is a corresponding function to turn one of those things into another. So for instance, uh, float, by the way, float is very rarely used because it's pretty easy to turn something into float. You can just add it to a float. Um, more important is turning things into strings. So for instance, if I did want to do something like uh, print, the answer is 55, I can't simply just do that. That's going to give me an error saying you can't add a string and a integer together. But I can then tell Python that I would like that to be a string and turn it into a string. So str is the function to turn into string. And of those, by the way, that's the most important one. Um, so you can make any, anything in Python a string by turning it into, into um, a, by putting it in str. Yes? Why would you just put that in quotation marks? Wouldn't that just make it a string? It would have. But I'm going to get back into variables. I'm going to go. I'm going to now dive into variables. But excellent question. He's asked why did what I just put in a quotation mark, and the answer is because I was just trying to show off the function. Um, you can put anything into the string, and it'll turn it into a string, including, including uh, putting another function in there, right, without calling it, and it says here's the string class int. We'll get into that much, 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 much later. Point is, is that everything has a type, anything can be turned into a string. All right, so now going back into functions, right? A fun I'm oh, sorry, not functions, variables. So variables are exactly what they sound like, like in, um, like in math, right? So I can say like x is equal to 5, okay? Right, and now what that does is that that stores 5 in x. So now if I were to say x plus well, x gives me 5. If I do x plus 1, it'll give me 6. And if I do uh, x plus, sorry, if I do x plus y, it gives me error because why? 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 Well, why? <laughs> it wasn't an intentional joke. I mean that in WHY. Why is it giving me an error? Because y is not defined. It says that y doesn't exist yet, right? I created a variable called x and said, I give it the value 5. Here, where it's looking for y. I haven't given y a val value yet, so y doesn't exist. OK? So variables only exist when you create them, right? There is no um, p value for pi, but as soon as I say pi is equal to 3.14159, then I can start using that, right? So that gets into this equal sign, which is actually a lie. Uh, this equal sign does not mean equal. Okay, because that um, it's very important to understand this, and this is possibly the like the concept. So if you draw nothing else for the lecture, everything else just seeps out through your ears. This is the thing to remember. The equal sign establishes a um, assignment. It's an assignment operator. It says take the thing on the right and store it in the variable on the left. So here we're take this statement says. Take 6 and store it in x. The expression on the right gets stored, gets evaluated, and then the result of that expression gets stored on the left. So for instance, x is equal to, so here x is, is x plus 1 would be 7 because x is 6. 6 plus 1, that gets evaluated as 7. So y is equal to x plus 1. Very important thing here. We evaluate the expression on the right and store it in the variable on the left. So y is equal to x plus 1. What is x plus 1? 7. y is equal to 7. x is equal to 10. 
What is y? Seven. The value on the right. So the value on the right, it gets evaluated. The value on the right gets evaluated, gets stored on the left. So good news. You don't have to remember what x and y were, really, except when you look it up. Right? You don't have to, so one, changing one isn't, you don't have to remember to change, if you change one variable, you don't have to remember to change the other. That's good news. That's less mental work for you. Does that make sense? Okay. So, right, so we basically get the answer and store it on the left. That's what I mean by basically this isn't an equality operator. It's not sendi setting up a hard binding between, between x and y. It's not saying these permanently things are permanently linked. We're just saying we're going to use the value y, uh, x over here to figure out what we want y to be. And we're only going to use it once. Okay, value. Um, so now variables don't actually have to be numbers, right? Because, uh, right, x is equal to uh, hello, right? If the things, if by, the, that's perfectly legal, by the way. So you can store anything you want in a variable. So we'd be in real big trouble if y is equal to x plus 1 was an equation rather than an assignment, right? Because then we'd be saying hello plus 1 is equal to y. And then if we get one to y, it'd be a bit of an issue. Oh, why? That, that tick was because I hit the tick uh, while I hit the enter. So that's why. Um, OK. So again, it's important to So again, equality sign means the value, the value on the left over here gets stored in the variable on the right. Um, now there's rules for variables. Uh, first off, we are not limited to the fact to um, things like um, so we're not limited to basically using one letter like you are in physics. We can actually like say uh, say things like uh, this um, num states equals fifty, right? I can actually give it a descriptive name, right? I can give it a descriptive name. Um, now variables have to be all one word, so num state so num states equals fifty just won't work. It has to be all one word. So uh, if you need if you want a variable to be number a uh, multiple number of words, there are two competing uh, ways to do that. Two different conventions. The first is the one I just did, which is uh, camel case because it has a lot of humps in it. Num states in United States, right? This is camel case, uh, where basically the first letter is lowercase and everything else is lowercase. But when we start a new when we start a new word, we make that first letter of that word uppercase, right? It's camel case because it's got a lot of humps created by the capital letters. Makes sense to everybody, right? Um, and it results in something that's semi-readable. Okay. The other way to do it is um, is to use underscores. I don't know if it has a uh, fun name. Num states in United States, and you just simply make it all lowercase, and you hit the underscore key a bunch. Which way is the way? Which way is the correct way for Python? Uh, the answer is, I, is that uh, the developers of Python like the underscore way of doing things, but, the, but honestly, it doesn't matter so long as you're consistent. You don't want to use, you don't want to mix camel case and, and like have some variables in camel case and some being underscored in your program because then you're trying to remember, wait, was I using, was this variable underscored or was it camel case? Don't want, don't want to make unnecessary work for yourself. Yes? Um, oh, define. Like, um, like when you said x equals 10 and then you said like x equals 7, like will they always overwrite or can you? They will overwrite. They will, oh, so the values will overwrite. And there's no way to like store it kind of. Like to keep it in, from being unchanging? Yeah. There is. Well, I think what you're saying, uh, but I'm just saying there's two ones where you say like, okay, so you have num states is 50. So if you make Puerto Rico a state someday, then I'll say num states equals num states plus 1. 
Right. Yeah, but yeah, we didn't want to get into the self-referential oh, okay. today. Um, I think that's what, yeah, like, but it's like, why isn't it persisting? The first F, if you use the same exact name, then you're you're referring to that place that you put them. So when you first put something somewhere, you say, okay, here's my little box called F, and if I want, I put this in it, and then if I put something else in it, I'm with an assignment operator, which is the equals. Then I'm saying, go ahead and. So in the textbook, they have examples of how this works. And basically here, this code over here, these three lines establish basically the variable has this value over here. Um, now, one of the things I do like is actually in our book is something called code lens, which will one, run through this, and it will show you the variables as you go through. And so it will basically give you the state of your program as it's going through. Um, in Java, there is a way to keep a value from changing by declaring the variable final. I don't know if, the, I don't know if there's an equivalent in Python. Um, I can't remember for the life of me. And that's, saying, and that's coming from somebody who really likes Python um, and did their dissertation in Python. Uh, I don't know that. It's just something you really don't need that often in when it comes to this kind of kind of language but um, there is let's see ah uh, yeah that's that's yeah so in very in general though you can't really prevent it from being overrided but that's more of a feature than a bug yes a function to yeah essentially that's what you have to do but I mean it's not Again, overriding this is a feature, not a bug. I'll go ahead and bring it up, right? Um, so, right, let's go ahead and see x. So let's go ahead and set up x is, now we can clear all this stuff out by saying, by restarting the shell, by the way, right? Each time you run a program, everything gets reset, right? So if you run one program and say x is equal to 1,000, and then you can't print it out in another program, right? Unless you are explicitly loading it. Right here, see, I restarted the shell cleared all the variables out, x is equal to 5. So let's go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and now show this in a script at the moment, right? So let's go ahead and do, for the last one, let's call this numbers.py, or numbers, right? So I'm going to say x is equal to uh, 5, and then I'm going to print x plus 2, or x plus 5, right? Let's do that, right? And so this runs those two lines, x is equal to 5, and then print x plus 5, which gives us 10. Let's go ahead and move this there and that there. OK. I suppose I could move, and I'll keep actually this guy. And I wish I had this tiling better. So boom, but OK. So now let's go ahead and do something interesting. So this is why, why the assignment operator is an assignment operator and not an equality operator, because you can do something pretty interesting, which happens a lot more often than you think. So let's go ahead and do print x. So what is the, val what is the second value of x? I heard the answer. It's 6. Remember, we evaluate the expression, the way e the equal sign works, the assignment statement works, is that we evaluate the expression on the right. So 5, so what is, so we ask, so we first do the right side. What is, what is x? x is equal to 5. Add 1 to it. It's 6. Now we take 6, that's what this thing is, and store it in here. This becomes, and so now x's value is 6. So let's go ahead and just print out x that first time as well. So its value is 5, and then we increment it. So this operation we call an increment operation, and that increments this value to 6. 
This happens a lot of times when we're doing loops and trying to count how many times we've done, uh, done a loop. Um, but basically this, again, what we're doing is we're evaluating the thing on the right and we're storing it on the left. So we can store pretty much anything we need to in a variable, which is pretty awesome. Essentially think of variables as making new nouns in your program, essentially. New things to interact with. So, um, so let's go ahead and let's see, how much time do I have left? 10 minutes. Ten minutes. What can I do that's interesting in 10 minutes that's not in the homework that I have for you guys? Uh, let's see. The first quiz will probably be next week, just to show you on Tuesday, just to show, and it's not going to be a quiz over anything in particular. It's more to show you how the quiz, wor how the quiz system works. So we're going to do it beforehand. We're going to definitely review beforehand. We're going to def I always like to review the content before in the quiz. There's no reason that there, and I, and I don't mean this in the like, if you don't get 100, bad, like I, I'm going to judge you. But there's really no reason why you shouldn't get 100 because the points are going to be very, the questions are going to be very easy. What I'm going to try to do is basically show you the different formats of questions you can expect on the quiz, as well as how the quiz works. That's what I'm, again, just like the first assignment was making sure that you could, that you could get Python running, the first quiz is going to make sure, do you understand how the quiz works? Right? So the quiz will be done via, a, via Canvas. It will be on Canvas, so you'll need a phone or a laptop to take the quiz. And let me know if that's an issue. Um, and Mm-hmm. Ah, yes. So um, let's go ahead and show a base. Um, let's, let's go ahead and the point of the of let's go ahead and just bring. Uh, um, let's go ahead and bring this together. Um, let's go ahead and create a new file. Call it introductions. Okay. So here, so this will be the last program I put in, and then, then I'll dismiss you, okay? So um, let's go ahead and start with one. Name is equal to, let's go ahead and say, print, hello, please enter your name. So basic program over here, hello, please enter your name. And then we'll use the input function. And what that will do is that this will store the user's input into the name. OK? So this will get you the, uh, the username for uh, this. Um, and then let's go ahead. Please enter your age. age is equal to input. Print name plus is plus age plus years Old. And notice that I've got like random spaces just spat, uh, spattered in there. But let's go ahead and see what this does. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to run this. Hello, please enter your name. And now it's not doing anything. So when a program sees the input, it's waiting for the user to actually input something. And it's not going to do anything until, until it does. So I hit, ent I hit entered Andrew and I and now it says, please enter your age, 32. And so now what it did is that it took name, the string, added it to is. Specifically, it added it to space is, to space is space. If I didn't have a space there, again, evil genie. Let's go ahead and see without, without if I don't have those spaces in there. But anyway, it glued name to is, and then it glued name and is to age, and then it glued that to years old. 
Now, I didn't have to convert the age into a number because age was already a number. Input takes in a string. I didn't have to convert, sorry, it into a string because, the, because it's already a string. So let's go ahead and see what happens if I forgot those spaces. Enter your name, Andrew, 32, and it just simply does Andrew is 32 years, and we have a space here because we have a space here. So those spaces were necessary because, again, we're saying we want to glue these lifts together. So that's really um, what we've got for this week. So if you want to do your readings uh, in the textbook, for the most part, we have gone over um, chapters one and two, um, or most of chapter one and parts of chapter two, most of chapter two. So we will get into more things this upcoming in the upcoming uh, week or two. So I'll be thinking about what what. Yeah, one and two right now. It's the, that's the material. Your greatest enemy right now is uncertainty, but that's okay.